Great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's, um, it's a real honor and privilege to share with you tonight. Are you all okay? <laughs> it was uh, a few months ago when I last came to be with you. And this is always a delight and a privilege to come to just share uh, God's word with you and something that God has laid on my heart to share with you. Uh, many of you know that um, my journey from Caldicott led me to the Rhonda, and uh, I've got good news for you. I'm no longer pastor in a church in the Rhonda. Oh, it's good news. <laughs> and the, the reason why it's good news is that I'm no longer needed, which is great news, because the church uh, has been established and it's grown. Uh, we have in the region of 60 people in that church, and we've established leaders. When you read through scripture and you see the, the model of Paul, uh, Paul's model of church planting is to uh, establish a congregation and then to allow local people to lead that church and then for the church planters and others to move on uh, to do other ministries and do what God has called them to do in other areas. It's an exciting time. Um, it's an exciting time to be a pastor without a job. Um, because you're not needed and so many pastors are so insecure that they have to hold on tightly to something uh, that they, they, they run or they're part of an organization but pastors have got to let churches go we've got to release others and the church that I planted I, I was I was outsourced by younger people it was a young church with young people from the Rhonda come in and it was exciting and we saw people saved we saw people baptized and and now this morning they met and uh, they worship God in the local college and other younger leaders have come I still live in the Rhonda Luke and Luke's mum and others uh, that, that we that we work with still in the Rhonda um, but seeking what God will do next Anyone ever get in that position? You're seeking God as to what you need to do next. It's called the faith gap. Don't panic when you're in the faith gap. But sometimes you have to leave one thing to arrive at the next thing. But there's a period of time where you're off the ground. And you don't feel stable and solid. So I just encourage you to plant your feet on the rock of Christ Jesus. Whether you're in a secure position or an insecure position, where you, whether you're in a position where you don't know what will happen, your dear drummer, he doesn't know what's going to happen. His health is in a faith gap. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. So just, it, that's just a little bit of an update on uh, our situation and how God has led us and you prayed for us and you've supported us and you've encouraged and I know Luke and I uh, came to the, the Curry Nights I think it must have been last year and we shared some things with you then and you've been such a blessing into our lives this weekend this is the fourth service I've spoken in the fourth service and preaching, preaching and sharing and sharing uh, and you do it because God lays it on your heart but I've got to tell you this that out of everywhere I've been, uh, I was looking forward to coming here tonight. And do you know why I was looking forward to coming? Not because of your worship band, although they are pretty cool, uh, but because there's a faith-filled atmosphere. And your, your people, men and women of God, who are believing that God is going to speak into your life, and for a preacher and a pastor, that ramps up the pressure because you're coming expectant as to what God will say. And I believe that God has placed a word on my heart for you. For individuals that are in this church, or maybe as a collective church. I want you to open your Bibles, if you brought your Bible, to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. If you haven't brought your Bible, open up your phone. If you haven't got a phone... Um, then, well, I don't know what to do, but there's no problem. There might even be actual Bibles in the church, which would be a great place to find a Bible. It's two verses that God has laid on my heart for you. 
And I want to ask you if you're ready and equipped for the journey. As a, as a pastor and as a preacher and as a church leader, I see so many people begin the journey. I see so many people give their lives to Christ. I see so many people, wherever your baptismal pool is, if you've got one, baptized. Is it at the, uh, over there? Baptized. And everyone goes, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And everyone sings and shouts and jumps around. The new life has come into the house. But do you know the saddest thing for me? is that when people drop off the journey. Because they're not equipped for the call of God on their life. And I want to preach this into this atmosphere uh, tonight. I'm going to read this, and this is a, a warning and an encouragement for you tonight. Is that okay? I've preached it to myself a few times, so I want to share it with you tonight. Uh, verse 13, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. That's the word for you tonight. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything in love. Are you equipped for the journey? This tonight will help. But this isn't it. This is just a snapshot of your life. You might be here for one, maybe two hours tonight. You may be even here for three hours if we have a cup of tea and a biscuit. But this is just a snapshot of your life. This won't determine what you do out there. What you do out there determines what you do in here. Are you equipped and ready for the journey? Are you prepared? You see, some of you, I was praising uh, with Luke and my arms were in the air and I felt that God was saying to me, some of you are tired. You're tired of the journey. You're not physically tired. You're spiritually tired. You're tired of the journey. The expectation of what you thought would happen hasn't happened. Some of you are disappointed in the journey. Some of you believe that change would come into your life much quicker than it has. Some of you want to arrive without taking the journey, without doing the hard steps, without doing the hard yards. And I say that to you in love, and I say that to you as a brother and uh, to the sisters in Christ. Some of you are disappointed. Some of you are spiritually tired. Some of you in this room are faking it. You're following the patterns of what others are doing. But you're not walking your own journey in Christ. Oh dear, that's not popular, is it? <laughs> but I say it in love. And I say it because I know what it is to fake worship. Do you know why I know what it is to, how it is to fake worship? Because I faked worship. In my 30 years of being a Christian, I faked worship. I've watched the patterns of the church environment that I'm in. In a charismatic environment, if you put your hands up, you're all right. In a Baptist-type church environment, if you put your head down slightly, you're very, very holy. <laughs> If you stick your hands up in a Baptist church, they'll just think you're mad. <laughs> but we adopt the patterns of the environment that we're in. And what God wants from you and what he wants from me is genuine, authentic worship. Amen. And genuine, authentic worship happens when you walk through those doors. And I want to ask you tonight, are you, when you're singing these worship songs in your front room, in your car, in your workplace, when you've got them, when you're running, or when you're jogging, or when you're at the gym, are you streaming down with tears? Do you feel the Holy Spirit welling up inside you? And when that's happening, you know that you're taking the right path. When you're in the, the queue, waiting for your Chinese food. <laughs> and there's 10 people in front of you and they're really, really slow. 
You know if you're equipped for the journey because you love all those 10 people and you're happy to wait an hour for your Chinese food. First point. Are you equipped for the journey? If you're going to be equipped for the journey, you've got to be on your guard. I recently uh, went on a holiday to Bulgaria. Um, I didn't know my wife and daughter came with me, and I didn't know that it was the party capital of Bulgaria. If anyone's ever been to Sunny Beach, uh, perhaps some of uh, the people might have been to Sunny Beach in their past life. It's like a drug gambling uh, party capital of Bulgaria. It's a crazy wild place. A casino owner was shot dead in his car while we were there. Somebody drowned on the beach and other crazy wild things happened. Well, we got a cheap holiday and we went to Bulgaria. And it was lovely, but we just, the, you know this beat? Boom, 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 boom. All through the night. You know what, some of you know what that is. Boom, 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 boom. Well, the nightclubs and the parties went on till four or five o'clock in, in, the, in the morning. But we had a lovely time and we got on really, really well. And we were going to fly back to Cardiff. We got on the coach to come back to Cardiff. We got on six o'clock in the morning. And I want you to think about being on your guard. Because when me and Hannah, Hannah's my daughter, uh, Luke's sister, got on that coach and my wife was sitting somewhere else, there was a guy behind us and he was absolutely hammered. He'd been drinking all night and he just got on this coach, but he'd been drinking and eating. And you could tell that there was stuff going on in his stomach. Apologies to anyone that's eating on uh, Facebook Live, but there was, so, there was stuff that was going on in his stomach and you could sort of hear it and you were aware that something was going on with this guy. And he was, he was swearing and he was blaspheming and then he went to sleep and then he woke up. Well, as soon as the coach stopped at the airports, me and Hannah quickly moved away from him and he leant over our seat and he brought up all of the contents of his stomach all over the seats where we were sitting. It was his food. There were carrots in it. I don't know, I, I, I don't know how he'd been eating carrots, but there were carrots in it. There was various uh, uh, substances that he'd been drinking and it was all deposited all over the seats in front of us. You know, if me and Hannah had been asleep on those seats, we'd have been covered in the stuff that he released on us uh, via his mouth. I want you to think of that as a spiritual analogy, that we need to be on our guard at all times. Do you know together in this building, we're strong. Did you know that in this building we're strong? The devil doesn't have a place in this building. Did you know that the devil's probably hanging about in the car park and he's trying to get in and he's trying to send his demons and, and all his, his minions and all the people that, that are with him. He said, I, I want to get at those people. And God's going, you won't get in there. So what the devil does is he just waits outside. He says, I can get them on a Sunday night when they go back home. I can get them on a Monday morning. I can get them on a Wednesday afternoon. I got six and a half days opportunity where I can attack them. I want to encourage you to be the church and to be on your guard at all times. And so many Christians just lie asleep. They lie asleep and they go, well, I go to church, I'll put some money in the velvet bag when it comes around, I'll sort of uh, fake my worship and I'll do some things and everyone will go, hey, that guy's good, hey, that girl's good, I'll wave a flag, I'll do some things that everyone else is doing. I want to encourage you, be on your guard. Jesus said these words in Mark 14, 38, watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. Watch and pray. Be on your guard on the journey, on the following of Jesus every single day, seven days a week, 100% of the time. Don't slip away from your guard. Jesus said, watch and pray. What have we got to watch for? We've got to watch for the environment that we live, the people that we place ourselves amongst. 
You see, people can lift you up and they can drag you down. Amen. If you've ever been in those situations, you want to be with people that are going to lift you up. Watch and pray so that you do not fall into what? Into temptation. Where does temptation start? It starts in the mind and works through the body into your actions. Watch and pray. Be aware of the environment that you're placed in. Be aware of the people that you live with, the people that you do life with. God said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1 verse 11, Jeremiah, what do you see? It's a prophetic statement. It's not, I see some chairs, I see a floor. He's saying to Jeremiah about the environment that God has placed him in, what do you see? It's a prophetic message for us today. What do we see? What do you see when you see the church? What do you see when you see your family? What do you see when you see your future? What do you see when you see your journey? Watch, be alert, be self-controlled and be alert. Watch and pray. I want to ask you, what is your prayer life like? What is your prayer life like? R really now, it, it, that's not, we're not faking this. No point. We could do other things on a Sunday night, couldn't we? So much else we could do. What's your prayer life like? I used to run marathons. Not anymore. I'm too old and too fat. And my brother, who is a proper marathon runner, said, John, you're always trying to cut corners. You're always trying to run the marathon without the hard yards and the training. And sometimes we're trying to find the destination before we're prepared to take the journey. People say to me, John, what are you going to do now? Now uh, you've left Dream Center and you've left Sports and Marvels and you've handed the church on to other people. So do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to seek the Lord. Amen. Anyone else tried that system? Or, or I could use this system. I'll go on Facebook and I'll say, what, do you, what world, social media world, what do you think I should do? What a waste of time. I'll ask all my non-Christian friends, what shall I do? What a waste of time. I'm going to go to the one that I think knows my future. He knows my presence. And he knows where he wants me to go. And that's who I'm going to go to. And you know there's some days when heaven is silence. Has anyone ever got a prayer life like mine? You know when you're on your knees or you're sitting on your bed or you're sitting in your prayer chair? Hope you've got a prayer chair. These are important. Or a place where you pray a walk and heaven is silence. You're saying, Lord, what do I do? Where will I go? And heaven stays quiet. Do you know what I want to encourage you to do? Press in. Press in. Don't give up. Be on your guard. To be equipped for the journey, we need to stand firm in our faith. I, I love coming here because you understand these things. You understand what it is to be in the spiritual battle. You understand when I say stand firm in your faith that it, it's a supernatural, God-ordained position. It's not a place of pridefulness and it's not a place of stubbornness. It's a supernatural, God-ordained position that only Christians understand. What does it mean to stand firm in a position? What you're called to do, you need to do. Where God calls you to do it, you need to go and do it. You see in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 18, Paul writes this to the church at Ephesus, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God. You can't cut corners when you're following Jesus. Put on the full armour of God so that when you take your stand, stand firm, in the faith, when you take your stand against the devil's schemes, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Where do we take our stand? My battle isn't against flesh and blood. And I want to tell you that so many Christians fight against each other. So many Christians argue with each other. So many Christians divide unity in the spirit against one another. Oh, this, this brother does this, this sister does that, this person's not anointed, this person's not filled. Do you know what? Let God deal with them. Let God deal with human beings. We stand firm in the supernatural position that God has placed our feet. We stand against the devil's schemes. Every single person that's here tonight, the devil is putting together a scheme against you. The devil is putting together in his little scheming devil workshop, he's putting a scheme against you. Against you, against you, against you, against... Well, I could do it with all of you. And you know he's putting a scheme together against me. I'm prayed up. Thank you for that, Ken. The, pa the pastor and preacher is always prayed up. Pray for the, the soil and the, the, the place that it's going to go. Amen. But the devil is putting a scheme together against every single person that's in this building. What are you going to do? Are you going to let the devil just carry on with his scheme? Devil, I think the scheme is going to be good. I'll tell you what the devil's scheme for your life is. To kill you, to destroy you, and to take anything that's good in your life away. And we go along with the devil's scheme and we say, devil, it's not going to be too bad. It's not going to cause me too much harm. It's not going to take away too many good things in my life. It's not going to rid, rid me of the anointing of God that's on my life. And before you know it, as you've carried along with the devil's plan and the devil's scheme, you're away from God. Yeah. Your Bible study is cold. Your prayer life is empty. Your heart and passion for worship has gone. Your desire to share the good news with, of Jesus with the world in which we live is non-existent. And then the devil's scheme is to get you to start doing things in private. Do you know why the devil wants you to do things in private? Because he tricks you and he tells you that no one's watching. No one will ever find out. And one thing just won't hurt, will it? I've got a friend who's an alcoholic called Mark. He's a follower of Jesus and he's passionate. And he tells me that one drink will wreck his life. Then one drink won't make any difference. God's scheme the devil's scheme. We stand firm in our faith. We stand firm together. If you're struggling in various areas of your life, create an accountability partner. So on my computer at home, a lot of pastors struggle with pornography. Did you know that? A lot of pastors are on the computer a lot, emailing, Facebooking, writing things, writing sermons, on one hand writing a sermon, and on the other hand looking at pornography. And I decided when I was first a pastor that I would do something that would stop this happening. I wouldn't have any passwords on my computer or on my phone. And I would say to my wife that you can go on the computer anytime you want and you can look at anything on the computer. Develop accountability structures. The devil will try to isolate you and then he'll try and destroy you. And he'll tell you one thing at a time. Do this, do this, do this, do this. Oh dear, that person's gone. Oh well, the devil don't care. Start on the next one. The devil has got a scheme and a plan for your life. 
and he will have that till the day you go to heaven and be with the Lord. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous and strong. Anybody go to the gym? Yeah, yeah gymmers. That's good. But what do you go to the gym for? Get strong. That's great. Do I go to the gym? Huh. Do I look like I do? I don't go to the gym. Uh, perhaps I can't afford it. Perhaps I don't see the point. Uh, perhaps it's a bit smelly in there and a little bit sweaty. But some people go to the gym. They go to the gym because they want to be fit and they want to be strong. Well, to be equipped for the journey as a Christian, you've got to be courageous and you've got to be strong. Do you remember what uh, uh, God said to Joshua when uh, Joshua was about to take over from Moses? Uh, Moses was one of the greatest leaders that they'd ever had, uh, ever. The miracles he performed, the way he led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Joshua was going to step into his shoes. Big shoes to fill. You know what God is calling you to do? You need to be brave, strong, and courageous. Do you know why? Because you can't do it in your strength. You can go to the gym and you're, you know, you're looking in good shape and physically strong and I'm really, really pleased. But in your spiritual body, you won't be able to do it in your strength. And I believe that in this room, God is calling people to do things that in of themselves, they'll never be able to do. There's pastors in this room, did you know that? There's evangelists in this room, did you know that? There's intercessors in this room. There's people that are, that are going to build discipleship programs that are going to touch the lives of thousands of people. My son Luke over there, um, his pastor, he's come back from LA. He's only been uh, back for about a month. And his pastor, Matthew Barnett's, um, started with a tiny little church, much smaller than this. And now every month they reach 40,000 people on the streets of LA. If you ever see Matthew Barnett, Google him, watch some videos of him speaking. He looks like the weediest, hope he's not on uh, face, Facebook Live. He looks like the weediest, the puniest, and if you went, boo, he'd run away from you. But you know God placed in that man the heart of a lion. He didn't place in that man the body of a lion. He placed in that man the spiritual heart of a lion. I want you to know who you are in Christ. For Joshua, he had a really, really tough journey. But God said to him, be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Be strong and courageous. Joshua 1, 5, verses 6 and verse 9. Look it up, check it out. When God tells you to be brave, courageous, and strong, do you know why he's telling you that? Because there's a storm coming. <laughs> and you're either going into a storm, in a storm, or just coming out of a storm. Did you know that as a follower of Jesus? And the biggest storms you minister and operate in, God will give you more. Outside uh, Matthew Barnett's church, a guy was uh, shot. They bleed him to death on the floor. He went out into a park where uh, gangs fight. I think it's the Bloods and the Cribs. Is that right, Luke? Uh, blues and the Reds. Um, and when I went out there last year, I had a blue T-shirt on and someone said, there's snipers in those buildings and they're looking for people with blue shirts on. Don't go to LA with a blue shirt on. Uh, and I was sort of like walking along trying to hide my uh, blue shirt and waiting for the, the noise and I could have dived down. But thankfully, I was okay, as you can tell. Be strong and courageous. Not because you're strong, but because he is strong in you. You're not strong, but he is strong in you. Isaiah 40, 29, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Anybody tired in this building? 
Anybody disappointed? Anybody struggling? He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him, through Christ, who strengthens me. Do you know the moment you start doing it in your own strength and you start to fake it and you're putting your arms up but your heart's not broken before him, you'll get tired, you'll get disappointed, you'll get frustrated and you'll start to blame everyone else in your world. Look in your mirror because a reflection of you should be Christ. Because it's Christ that gives you the strength. Philippians 6.10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. You are not strong of yourself. You are strong in him and what he has done and he has accomplished. Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and our strength. He's an ever-present help in times of trouble. I've been a Christian for 30 years and this is how it works. There's no other way. Be strong in him. Finally, we're nearly at the end now. How are you doing? If you've, if you've heard me speak, ignore it. If you've heard God speak, do something about it. Will you do that? I've spoken four times uh, this weekend. And I felt the presence of God most strongly in this building. So bless you. Keep doing what you're doing. But there are some people here that might need to make some changes. Finally, do everything in love. This is the key. Do everything in love. Cross over there. Cross over there. Cross on the screen. Expression of love. So God loves us so much that he gave his one and only son. Do you know the word that's used here in the Greek is agape? And agape means the deepest the deepest form of love that any person can have for another person. For God so agapated the world that he gave his only begotten son. Paul says in uh, his letter to the Corinthians, do everything in agape. You see, God's love for us needs for us to repay that love to him. And when we repay that love to him because he saved us from eternal damnation, eternal separation from him, a place called hell, there's in, in the region of 95% of this area are going to hell. Many people in your friendship groups and your families are going to hell. God provided the answer in Jesus. Jesus is the answer to my life, to your life, and the problems of this world. Jesus is the key. And the love of God that was tied up in Jesus, Jesus was the atoning sacrifice. Jesus stood in my place and in your place. He took on himself the sin of the world. He endured separation from the Father for three days because he held my sin and your sin on his body on the cross. And it wasn't the nails that held him to the cross. It was love for you and for me. And the offering that I bring to him is measly, is pathetic compared to what he gave for me. And I am resolute in this journey to give love to him because he's worthy of all the love I can muster. And as we love him, it creates a desire in us to love others. We're not called to like, we're not even called to tolerate. We're called to love. 
And I believe that the world out there will want to know our Jesus. Not because of how we worship, not because of how we dance, not because of how I preach, not even because of a great curry night, although that's a great idea. But the world out there will want to know our Jesus because we love them. Because we love them. There's no shortcuts, there's no easy fixes for the church of today. We need to love the broken. We need to love the lost. We need to love the addicted. We need to love the annoying. We need to love the people that aren't going to love us back. We need to love the people on the streets that aren't even going to say thank you. And if this church will show the love of Jesus to the world and we can go on that journey of being on our guard and standing firm in the faith and being brave and being courageous, there won't be a seat in this building that will contain the people that will want to come. Why are our churches empty and why are they dying? Not because of Jesus, but because of us. I haven't got anything else to say. I'm emptied. (laughs) The Lord has allowed me to get a download and empty it. I don't know what your response is. Perhaps you want to go home and watch Strictly Come Dancing. (laughs) Perhaps you want to go and watch some porn or a horror movie. Perhaps you want to forget you were even here. Or perhaps you want to carry on worshipping the Lord. Perhaps I want to invite Ken. Perhaps we want to uh, make a commitment and come out the front and receive some prayer. Perhaps we want to kneel on the floor and recommit our lives to Christ because he's worthy of a recommitment. I love being in the waterfall of forgiveness. His grace covers my sin. And that what I've done yesterday and what I've done today the blood of Christ cleanses me from all sin. Don't panic and don't give up. There's a new day, and that new day is today. I think we'll probably have another song and just give you an opportunity to respond. I don't mind what you do. (laughs) I don't mind. I, I don't get any more blessed. <laughs> I'm at max. <laughs> but uh, but I, I do care what happens to you. And some of you are, are getting stuck. Some of you are getting stuck in the same place on the road. And you can't push through. And you can't break through. I believe today... Is your night of victory. Today is your night of breakthrough. Not because I'm here, but because the awesome, powerful Holy Spirit is going to break your chains. He's going to unlock the door and you're going to go into a new day and a new opportunity. Ken, come out and help me.